During the late Bronze Age and Iron Age, thousands of hill forts were built across the British Isles and Northern Europe. These forts typically followed the contours of the hills they were built on and were surrounded by multiple walls, earthworks and ditches, some of which still remain today. There were several different types of hill fort which modern day archaeologists characterise based on the number of ramparts they had and how they were positioned. They also varied in size quite considerably. What's remarkable is that although there are so many of them, 4,000 in Britain and Ireland alone, no one actually knows what they were for and dating evidence is very limited. Experts are fairly certain that the majority date back to the Iron Age, with a fair number going back even further to the Bronze Age. They also think that they were mostly built for defensive reasons, whether due to internal social and economic tensions or threats from abroad. However, this is highly debatable for a number of reasons, such as how some of them have multiple entrances, which doesn't make much sense for defence. There are also doesn't seem to be much consistency in terms of their design and layout which means finding an explanation for their role that meets all their varied characteristics is difficult. But dating and purpose aside, there's another peculiar feature of some of these hill forts that has the experts baffled. In this video, I'm talking about a phenomenon that was thought to be unique to hill forts in Scotland, but has now been found in other areas of Northern Europe as well. And that is the phenomenon of vitrification. Strangely, except for a few limited examples, it's not found in the hill forts of England, Wales and Ireland, just Scotland. And it's Scotland that has the best studied examples of vitrification out of all of Northern Europe. So they will be the main point of discussion in this video. The sources I've used are highly technical, but I've done my best to synthesize the data which comes from interdisciplinary research by geologists and archaeologists. These papers are linked in the description below. I've also put a link to the Atlas of Hill Forts of Britain and Ireland by Oxford University, which is a brilliant and easily navigable resource, as well as Historic Environment Scotland's entries on the sites I discuss. So what is vitrification? Vitrification occurs when stones are subjected to sustained heat above 1000 degrees Celsius. That's 1832 degrees Fahrenheit for my American friends, causing them to turn into a glass-like substance. Silicate rocks produce vitreous melts, whereas limestone produces burnt lime. So there's some variety in their appearance, but geologists can recognize when the stone ramparts have been subjected to this sort of process. There are around 200 hill forts in Northern Europe which show signs of vitrification in their rampart walls and there's been much debate over the years as to how and why this happened. It turns out that it's simply not that easy to vitrify stone and it would have been a lot more difficult in the Bronze and Iron Ages with the technologies that were available at the time. When vitrified stones were first discovered in these hill forts hundreds of years ago, antiquarians weren't sure if they could simply be a result of natural processes or not, such as lightning. But it soon became clear that human agency was required to produce this level of melting. Even though the hill forts are not megaliths, I'm interested in them because they are prehistoric and they are mysterious just the same. And I do think that in trying to understand anything about the ancient past, we need to delve into a number of different time periods different kinds of monuments and different cultures to really get a handle on what was happening back then. I'm also interested because Scotland is the hub of vitrified forts. It was also a wildly important area in the Neolithic with some of the earliest megalithic stone circles and settlements. I'm aware that the idea of certain megaliths worldwide, especially in Peru, having undergone vitrification is a hot topic, but that's not for this particular video. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Since remains are limited, I'm afraid the photographs and satellite images don't tell us much. I'll show them, but what's known from archaeological surveys or articles gives us a much better idea of how they looked. Dunadir Hillfort is near Inch in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, and sits on a conical hill which is 265 metres above sea level. The innermost rampart measures 67 metres by 27.4 metres and is highly vitrified. It encloses the summit of the hill. The hill fort has a trivalate structure, which means it has three lines of defence. The inner rampart has two entrances, one facing east-southeast and one facing west-northwest. 
Hazel rod samples were excavated from underneath the vitrified wall for radiocarbon dating, and six archaeomagnetic dates were taken from the vitrefaction itself. These all date the hillfort to the Iron Age. There were also traces of five prehistoric oval huts on the southern slopes of the hill. In the medieval period, a tower was built, the remains of which can clearly be seen on top of the hill from the surrounding countryside today. Parts of the vitrified wall were robbed out and used for this later construction. Another good example of vitrification is Langwell Hillfort. It overlooks the river Oikel near Langwell and has a circular dun with a highly vitrified wall that's five meters thick and two meters high. A larger fort encompasses the rest of the top part of the hill. The vitrified rampart has an east-facing entrance. The dun and fort date to the Iron Age, with the dun having been built later. For those of you who don't know, a dun is also a kind of fortification. Archaeologists excavated hammer stones, whetstones, an iron knife blade, a serpentine bead and a shale bracelet from the site. The vitrified stone wall was originally laced with timber. Post holes have been found which probably held wooden stakes on which a roof was placed. There are traces of three circuits of defence over a pretty extensive area. There are two forts close to one another on the island of Butte, one called Donegoyle Fort and the other called Little Donegoyle. The larger one is 91 by 23 metres and sits on a headland. Its stone rampart is 3.6 metres thick and shows signs of extensive vitrification once again. The entrances in this wall face south-southwest and east-southeast. Finds at the site date it back to both the Bronze and Iron Ages. A cave close by also produced evidence of occupation. The smaller fort is located on a crag and doesn't have signs of vitrification. It also has a cave close by containing archaeological evidence for habitation, including a midden and a half. It seems that the caves were occupied at the same time as the forts. In the same area there is a burial chamber, a Neolithic cup marked stone which ended up being built into the foundations of a medieval house, and other medieval remains. So this headland has a long history and has been important to the various cultures that have inhabited it. Tapo North has one heavily vitrified rampart enclosing the summit of the hill and a larger wall further down the slope. The inner rampart is 85 by 30 meters and has a thickness of 15 meters. That's huge. That's a lot thicker than the walls of the forts we've just discussed. It's not clear where its original entrance was. There were also traces of what might have been a ring ditch house on the same hill. Much of the site was destroyed by quarrying activities in the 1800s. There were also the remains of a well. So just from those few examples, it's clear that vitrification tends to be confined to the innermost rampart, the smallest enclosure in each hill fort, which sits on the summit. Various dating techniques that have been used on some of the better and more recently excavated vitrified hill forts show that their dating belongs to several time periods. Dates go back as far as the 3rd millennium BCE and as recent as the 1st millennium BCE. In terms of geography, they can be found in Scotland, France, Sweden and Germany amongst other European regions. So this wide range of dates, geographic locations, and hill fort building cultures makes it difficult to determine the role vitrification played in the lives of these buildings. It's generally thought that the vitrified ramparts were laced with timber. Since a large quantity of material would have been needed to vitrify a timber laced stone wall, along with a lot of water to facilitate melting and stop cracking, many researchers think that the process must have been intentional. Combustible materials and water transported over many kilometres would have been required to create such sustained temperatures as would have been needed for melting to occur. This effort and investment has led some experts to theorise a structural reason for vitrification, the idea being that stones were melted on purpose to help create stronger ramparts. In 1980, Yorkshire Television commissioned an experimental archaeology project to create a replica vitrified wall. 
The project was written up in the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland as well as being made into a documentary. This wasn't the first time such an experiment had been attempted. Child and Thornycroft had done something similar in the 1930s. However, it was the first time an almost full-scale replica had been produced. The wall was made of granite blocks from a dry stone dike and gabbros and igneous rock from a quarry. It was then laced with longitudinal and transversal wooden beams made of pine. The experiment, which took place at East Tullos in Aberdeenshire, produced only small amounts of vitrified material, around three kilograms in total. Much of this was in the core of the wall, which then became unstable. Since many of the excavated forts have much more vitrified material than this experimental wall, it was suggested that such a process would not have been advantageous from a structural viewpoint. This is also true when the unpredictability of the vitrification is taken into account. The experiment wasn't without its problems. The lack of hardwood, the newness of the wall, the short time of the experiment, the number of air holes and the dampness of materials were all seen as limiting factors. However, overall, the conclusion was that vitrification doesn't make sense as a construction method. Conversely, another study looked at 45 European hill forts and found that vitrification strengthened aggregates but weakened larger blocks, meaning a structural purpose couldn't be ruled out. However, if it had been done as a construction method to strengthen aggregate building material, then refractory local geology would have limited the extent of its success anyway. Funnily enough, the vitrified hill fort at saint Suzanne in France has a legend attached to it that it took seven years for its glass wall to be built to keep out wild beasts. This implies a motive of intentional construction for its vitrified wall, but this intentionality is not borne out by the geological evidence. One study which analysed three hill forts in Lochaber found that vitrified sections of the same rampart had different cooling histories and had lower crystallization temperatures than the expected 1000 degrees Celsius. These varied between 800 and 950 degrees Celsius. This data indicates uncontrolled melting rather than intentional vitrification for construction purposes, which means it could have been caused by an accidental fire or a fire caused by a battle. One argument against vitrification being the result of sustained battles is that an attacker would have to be very close to the ramparts for long periods to create the high temperatures needed. This would have been unlikely in a hostile battle situation. Although a legend associated with the Scottish lords Fetacane and Dunciane does say that their conflict led to the demolition by fire of each other's hill forts. Other researchers suggest that the hill forts were destroyed on purpose with a great fire by attackers after they took control of them and that this was done as a symbolic show of power with vitrification being a byproduct of this operation. Surely that would have been quite a waste of resources. Would an attacker not want to show strength by immediately taking over and reinforcing the fortifications rather than burning them down and having nowhere to go? Along similar lines, there's the idea that the builders of hill forts destroyed them when they had fallen out of use, possibly for ritual purposes, a sort of decommissioning of the building. The archaeological record shows that some vitrified walls were reinforced at later dates and that the forts continued to be used after the melted ramparts had been formed, but this could have been by a different group settling in the area after some years. Another idea is that the whole purpose of building the forts was for their eventual destruction and that the larger they were the bigger and more impressive the fire would have been. This is seen by experts as a ritual undertaking and something that would have been seen from many kilometers around. In the earlier Neolithic period it's known that entire settlements were often burnt down this way and archaeologists have found evidence for this having been a ritual ceremony when the villages were abandoned. So it's entirely plausible and it does seem that experts are most drawn to the idea of ritual destruction. While we're on the subject of the Neolithic it's also worth noting that many megalithic monuments appear to have been subjected to fire and lots of stones and statues within these structures seem to have been purposefully smashed. One example is the Tarshin temples in Malta. Archaeologists aren't sure whether this was due to decommissioning of the site, due to an attack from outsiders, or due to reuse of the temples in a later time period. 
I still think this idea of an abandonment ritual is a bit of a stretch. I think that the purpose of the hill forts is misunderstood, and that's why it's difficult to find a conclusion that meets all their varied attributes. Just a few questions spring to mind. If they were for defence, why were there so many of them? Surely it would have made sense to have several large, really well fortified buildings rather than thousands. I've asked the same about the Bronze Age towers called Nuragi in Sardinia. Also, why don't all of the Scottish hill forts show signs of vitrification? Why were Scottish and Northern European hill forts burnt down in a supposed ritual abandonment ceremony, but not those in England and Wales? It's mind-boggling, and I think they are still a major mystery. Another one I'm trying to solve. Stay with me. Let me know what you think in the comments. Please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. I'm on Patreon and I'm very cheap. <laughs> The link to my page is in the description below. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter for more content and take a look at my website.